And so we move to the very final talk uh, of Lobster, which is a short talk by John Gallagher on transforming big step to small step semantics using interpreter specialization. Thank you. Good. So in a short time, I hope to uh, show you what we're doing. It's very much work in progress, uh, research in progress as a, as a short paper. And uh, my co-authors, Manuel, Jose, and, and Pedro, are, have had many, many discussions about uh, the, the use of semantics, big step and small step semantics, for transforming programs into horn clauses, which you know, was, has arisen in a couple of uh, papers today. And uh, so big, both big step and small step semantics can be relevant. And so the question arose actually from an, another paper we, we presented about transforming, say, imperative programs into horn clauses about whether you could use similar techniques, interpreter specialization, to transform the actual semantics, big step semantics, into small step semantics. So big step semantics, uh, I, I mean, obviously formal semantics is really fundamental to any kind of uh, formal verification, uh, reasoning about programs. Um, and um, operational semantics dominates these days. I mean, there's axiomatic semantics as well, which has a very close relation to big, sem big step semantics. But both big step and small spe step semantics are useful for different purposes in in verification tasks. Some, a lot of people in, in working on types prefer small step semantics for verifying type soundness, for example. Big step semantics is often used for uh, resource analysis, among other things, and other verification tasks. It was developed by Gilles Kahn in the, in the 1980s uh, as a kind of proof theoretic approach to operational semantics, and it's based on structural decomposition of statements. So the classical example is, the, say, the uh, statement composition in an imperative language. I used the uh, the down arrow for the big step uh, in the paper. I used a long straight arrow, but I think it's clearer uh, on the slides to have a down arrow for the big step and a, and a straight arrow for the small step. So the big arrow, big step, if, if, if statement S1 in state sigma uh, zero uh, evaluates in total, you know, a complete ex evaluation leaving state sigma one, and similarly S2 evaluates in state sigma one to sigma two, then the composition S1, S2 evaluates to uh, in state zero to state two, state sigma two. So it's a very structural, compositional, it's not quite compositional because if you look at uh, <clears throat> the while statement, obviously it will, uh, the while statement will have it appear, the while construct will appear above and below the line, but uh, in, in some cases uh, where there's no subformulas, like an assignment statement, for example, then you have an axiom, which has just got something below the line and possibly a condition. In small step semantics developed by Plotkin, actually earlier than, than Kahn's uh, work, uh, the very early 80s, um, a, an execution of a program also deals with configurations of a state, uh, a statement and an environment or a store of some kind. And um, a small step takes you from a statement in a given state to the next statement in the next state. And then a complete execution is a run of small steps, so say the, the uh, uh, transitive closure of the, um, <clears throat> of the small step relation. And uh, in fact, you typically have a, a special small step for the final step, which only leaves a state or a value. If, if you're dealing with something like the lambda calculus, then it deals with values rather than returning a final state. But that's a minor uh, difference. So, in, so to look at statement composition again, we, we have S1 semicolon S2, and the, the first rule eats away at S1 in small steps until it's finished and then moves to S2. So, uh, so if S1, if S1 in one small step goes to S1 prime, then S1 semicolon S2 goes to S1 prime semicolon S2 in the next state. 
Uh, and then if, if S1 does terminate in one small step, then we move with that resulting state to the next state. And uh, similar, actually, the, for, for axioms, for things with no, nothing above the line, then the small steps and the big steps are the same. They terminate in one, one small step. So um, here's an example. It's kind of essential to our work that we represent everything as horn clauses. I well, perhaps not essential, but uh, because you could formulate it in other, other ways, obviously. But, but it's very convenient and, and very direct. So if you look at a textbook example, here's the call by value lambda calculus, some um, big step rules. Um, we can see that we can just encode them directly as horn clauses. And in fact, judgments of all kinds are horn clauses. If you, if you, providing that you can encode the, 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 the statements and the state as first order terms, then, then the, the, the arrow is just a predicate. And uh, we have, uh, you know, the head below the line and the body above the line. So, I mean, you can see that here we have uh, three premises plus a construction for updating the state, and they are the body of the, the corresponding horn clause rule. And then, of course, we have to encode in su some suitable horn clauses the, uh, the subsidiary predicates like finding uh, something in the state and updating the state. So we have uh, big step semantics. We can directly re render those as horn clauses. And then uh, the idea of interpreter specialization, I'll just briefly go, go through. So it's a well-established idea, uh, going back to Futamura in 1971, where he showed that specializing an interpreter with respect to a source program is analogous to compiling that program into the language of the interpreter. It, so if you happen to have an interpreter in the same language as the source program, then you can regard the first Futamura projection as transforming the source program into another source program which encodes the semantics that you that are embodied by the interpreter so that might be a non-standard semantics so in the context of this paper if we regard our big step rules b as, a, as an evaluator we can say that if we evaluate a given statement and state with the the function represented by the big step we will get the final value but then what we're going to do what we did in, in this work is to write an interpreter that instead of that imposes some non-standard semantics on the the big step rule so it executes b in small steps so the interpreter when applied to the big step rules and an initial state uh, an initial configuration will yield the same value assuming that the interpreter is correct um, and then the specialization is that we specialize the interpreter with respect to B, but with an unknown initial state, uh, represented by this PE is a, a, a specializer, a partial evaluator. And this turns out, if we do it uh, right, uh, will contain the small step semantic rules corresponding to B. So we transform B into a, another set of horn clauses derived from the interpreter that as we'll see from an example, literally line for line contain the small step uh, rules. Now then, if you, then that's something that you could then apply directly uh, to <coughs> as a, uh, an initial configuration and you would get the same result B, uh, V. So how do we write this interpreter? Um, I'm just going to sketch it here because uh, there's a lot of detail which is in the paper and I don't have time to go through it. But supposing we take state and composition again. So we, we have a rule, a big step rule, but we're going to start by evaluating the first premise for S, the, the execution of S1. And let's see, say we say, well, we're going to turn this into a run going in small steps from S1 sigma 0 small step, small step, small step, to the final state, sigma 1. Well, the first, pre the first premise has, either has a run which terminates immediately, or it has a, f a, s a first step, small step, followed by a big step for the rest of, of, the, of the run, right? So we, we split off the, the first small step. So we can, so this is how we reason, and I'll show you the clauses of the interpreter in a second. So the remaining computation then is either the, the, the second premise, which is the second premise of the big step rule, or it's a big step 
from S1 prime, sigma 1 prime, the result of executing one small step on the original S1, and then the second premise. Now, in the first case, the small step rule then that will derive from the partially evaluated from the partially evaluated interpreter will be if we if we do a small step on S1 and it terminates right away, then from S1 semicolon S2 we'll just go straight to S2, as we'd expect. In the second case, we've got two goals, and the way we make it the next state is to fold those two goals. They are an instance of the same rule that we used to construct uh, the premise in the first place. So we can, we can fold it to get uh, S1 prime semicolon S2, sigma prime zero, big step to sigma two. So the rule becomes, if we do one small step, then we make one small step. This is the folding of the remaining premises. Right, in the paper we explain how you, when you can, you can fold. If you can't fold, you can't always fold. For example, you move from S1 sigma 0, but you may need S, either S1 or sigma later on in the second premise, for example. So you can't just throw them away and replace them by S1 prime, sigma 0 prime. And then we have a way of, of you looking at the, the structure of the remaining premises and creating an auxiliary big step rule and uh, inventing a new syntax constructor. All the other work on, I mean, there's in, in the paper we review some other work on transforming big step to small step, and they all do something similar. Of course, not surprisingly, we do, we, there are many common features, we just do it by an interpreter rather than a directly defined transformation. But, we, but they all get auxiliary uh, um, new syntax constructors. But you have to look at the paper to, to do that. So. So here, here um, having tried to motivate how we interpret the, the big step rules in a small step way, here are the first few clauses of the interpreter that we specialize. So first of all, we define a run because the, the small step and the big step are not exactly the same. I, to, to, to make them equivalent, we have to add the notion of a run, the transitive closure of the small steps to make it equivalent to the big step. So we. We define a run, which is uh, you know, either uh, a terminated, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, the empty list represents no steps remaining, no, no uh, configuration remaining, or something that has terminated, or if we have a single uh, big step call A, then we execute a small step on it, getting A's one, which, are, which is either terminated or another step, A, A1, and, and run that. And then the small step itself has three cases. The axiom, um, which just looks for a rule, and, well, there may be some conditions, but when you've evaluated, though, there's nothing else above the line, so that, that will yield, that will terminate. I didn't discuss also, we were also regard as a small step, big step rules, which essentially just translate one construct into another, and it's common to, to define, let's say, um, a for statement into an equivalent in, in, while statement with, a, with an initialization. So we regard those as small steps as well. So, so uh, but I'll skip over that. So the, the interesting case is this one. If you've got a rule with, with a, at least two premises, and the first one is a big step, then you do a small step on the first premise, B1, and then there's a, a, an operation to try to fold that to get the, the remaining step encoded as a single big step. Um, A's and it, it could be uh, term, that could also terminate so we, we can't say single bracket A1 or something we, we have to say it's either empty or or a, um, or a single goal so um, I'm going to give you a quick demo I hope I've just about time so um, if I look at uh, I mean Khan's original paper uh, Contain the, the big step semantics for mini ML. So it's, it's I mean, it's, it's, you know, got let rec and let and, and uh, applica application and a diff then else statement. So it's, so it's um, um, you know, it's, it's a reasonably comprehensive lambda calculus. Uh, um, it, then, as I showed, uh, you can just translate that re literally line for line, one to one into uh, horn clauses. Here's the, here's the rule for let rec, for example. Um, and then some subsidiary predicates for looking up the state and, and so on. 
So then, what I've got is a, is a, a script which uh, applies the, the partial evaluator to, to the interpreter with respect to that, um, sorry, um, with respect to that uh, set of big step rules. When we look at that, um, mini ML, here we are, you can see that it was created today at 1453, so I didn't do it earlier. Um, so the, the partially evaluated result contains the run predicate, and then this is the output of Logen, the partial evaluator I'm using, Michael Leuschel's uh, Logen system. But the small step rules, there's quite a lot of them actually in this case, um, because you have to create quite a few subsidiary uh, constructors. Um, but they are in a form, always in the form of uh, the, the head is what's below the line and the body is what's above the line. In, in all cases, it's either got a single small step above the line or something which is uh, just got to be evaluated uh, like a, one of these side conditions. So, so, I mean, I have written a, a script which translates this directly into defrac expression, LaTeX expressions. It's literally a one-to-one. -one. It's just a syntactic transformation. So um, we've done a number of examples uh, from the literature, and, um, and yeah, there are sm small differences from what other people have, pr have produced. Uh, uh, let's go back to the slides. But uh, there are minor differences. I mean, we are getting results, and furthermore, we can we, we can run all the interpreters. As I say, future work is to do some proofs of this, but we have some validation in the sense that we can run the original big step on some examples. We can do the transformation and run the small step, uh, the transformed interpreter with the small step rules and see that we get the same things. So, so first of all, we can check the correctness of the interpreter, so we're, you know, we get the expected results. So we can do extensive testing, is what I'm saying, which is no uh, substitution for a proof of correctness, but, um, but it, 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 it's um, more than what the other people doing uh, can, can do, because they, they don't, don't have the ability just to run the, the, small, the, the big step and the small step semantics directly as generated. So to finish off with, um, we're doing more experiments on literature examples, but we want to move to bigger, more realistic languages. And uh, the obvious one to look at, uh, or uh, let's say a very interesting one to look at, is Blasi and Leroy's sea uh, light big steps semantics for a large, uh, significant, uh, you know, interesting fragment of C. And this was the basis of the certified C compiler that Leroy's uh, famous for. Um, so what we would like to do is to translate this to small step semantics, um, because that will look a lot more like a, a machine. Uh, I mean, small step semantics is much more, uh, more related to a machine execution, going from state to state to, to, to state. So I think it will be an interesting uh, experiment to do, first of all, to, to thoroughly test the, uh, the, tra the transformation, um, the technique, and uh, the Secondly, to, to then compare with the, the, this the Blasi and Leroy's uh, development and proof of the equivalence of the big step semantics to some uh, execution level representation of the same program. We're doing the same thing. I mean, I don't expect there to be an initial I exact correspondence, but I think it will get, uh, enable us to gain some interesting insights into what's going on. So I've mentioned that we don't have a proof of correctness of the interpreter, um, um, and I could give you a hand-waving argument, but, uh, but that's obviously uh, a gap that has to be filled if we continue this work and write a full paper. Um, and I think it, it will be more straightforward and transparent than proving the correctness of the transformations that, that other people have done. I think proving the correctness of the interpreter really just um, is much more directly really related to the semantics rather than the mechanics of defunctionalization and continuations, passing, and so on, which is the basis of, of the other work. Uh, um, we'd also like to look at variations of the interpreter for things like reduction semantics. Um, you know, when you talk to people about s small step semantics, there's lots of different flavors of it, and sometimes you just get a value, and sometimes you have no environment, but just some 
some sequence of expressions that's reduced, and, but they're, they're all closely related, and I think we could do the same. It would be nice to show that the big step semantics was a basis for deriving various versions of small step semantics. And the other very interesting thing is, um, which I didn't even mention in the paper, actually, but it was in the back of my mind, was, was the, the interpreter as written, you could criticize it as, as being somewhat uh, artificial in the sense that you, we almost give a template of the, of the small step rules, uh, you know, in the, and then they're just instantiated by the rules. Uh, it would be more interesting to write a simpler interpreter that basically just linearly executed left to right, the premises, uh, you know, moving on to the next one whenever you uh, terminate it. But then you need a more complex specializer to, uh, to get the small step rules out of that. So there'd be a trade-off, um, an interpreter, a simpler interpreter that would be easier to prove correct, but then a, special, uh, a more complex specializer that might be harder to prove correct, but the specializer is a much more generic tool based in the end on things like unfold fold transformations which we know you know how to prove uh, 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 we know how to use them to prove something like a partial evaluator correct so i think this is where we would like to go and that's it thank you very much as well for the nice talk uh, to finish off lobster so questions where's the question Yeah, so um, the interpreters that you get, you mentioned that there's previous work that uses defunctionalization. Have you looked at how your interpreters, it looked like it introduced a bunch of these auxiliary uh, syntactic yeah. forms. Is, is that the same case for these existing works? Have I looked at what interpreters? Uh, you mentioned the existing work that uses defunctionalization yes, yeah. to do the same transformation. Does that introduce the same kind of syntactic uh, forms as, as yours? I saw that there were a lot of different syntactic forms. Well, yes. Um, the, the, the two pieces of work that I've most clo closely compared with are uh, Vesely and uh, Fisher, uh, who, who start with a, a definitional interpreter of functional language incorporating the big step rules and transform that via I think, 10 stages uh, with starting off with the continuation, passing, transformation, and then defunctionalization. But in the end, they, a lot of those transformations are incorporated really in, 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 in the specialization process. Also, the fact that we use a first order language um, uh, with a representation, a first order representation of the big step rules in the interpreter. I didn't go into, into that, but I think then that. The question, questions like defunctionalization disappear then. It's just a question of the, uh, an encoding of the, the rules, a suitable encoding. But the, but the invention of the new constructors and so on, I think, is very similar in, in all the pr previous work. I mean, the, the, the other work is by uh, Ambal, I think it is, in, in, in Aria. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, also starting from a definitional interpreter and transforming it. Um, but at some point, they say they look at the continuation and say, in this case, we need to inve invent a new constructor to, to capture the continuation, and they d define how a, a systematic way of doing that. So, not surprisingly, we're doing a lot of the same things. Um, but I I think the, as we say in the paper, we argue that this is an alternative way that uh, is arguably arguable probably um, more transparent uh, than, than the transformation-based approach. But maybe it's a matter of taste also. Well, thank you. So, so I guess we, we just thank the speaker and finish, and I guess I pass. Thank you. Thank you.